Okay, I think we are we're live. Oh, hey, um, can everyone hear me right now, panelists? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, so I'll do this. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today hey, for this. Uh, everyone, thank you for joining us today for this uh, International Women's Media Foundation's webinar. Um, lessons learned from journalists covering um, global, pandemic. global pandemic. From journalists covering and uh, global if you are pandemic. not familiar with us, then uh, IMF is the only NGO that offers safety training, NGO, reporting trips, byline opportunities, and more tailored to women journalists, both established and upcoming um, to, to everyone. Uh, we're based in Washington, D.C., and right now the IMF is solely focused on the best way to take care of our community. Um, in the coming days, we will provide our community with a detailed plan of the changes to each of our individual and group programs. We're working closely with our community members to access their safety, um, well-being, and how we can support them and their work during this challenging time. We are continuing our critical work as best as we can um, and make sure that even perhaps, especially in this uh, unpredictable time, women's voices are heard. This is the exactly the reason uh, we are gathering virtually here today with uh, five outstanding women each of their own field. Um, so I'll start to introduce our panelists today. Um, please raise your hand so people know who you are. Um, Nadia uh, Shia Cohen um, is uh, an independent photojournalist contributing to many international publications. She is based in Rome, Italy right now, and she is covering Zika. She covered Zika um, in Latin America and currently is covering COVID-19 in Italy. Rebecca Kaplan is a King Fellow at the Science History Institute based in Philadelphia. She has a PhD in the history of science from the UCSF and a Master of Science in Epidemiology from the University of Texas. She specialized in um, science communication and uh, the history of public health. Ken Lee is a tech reporter at Quartz based in Hong Kong. She's been covering COVID-19 in China since January. Um, she has a background in business reporting as well uh, with the South China, China Morning Post and uh, Bloomberg Business Week in the past. Claire McDougall um, is an independent journalist and writer based in Burkina Faso. She won the 2015 Kurt Schork Memorial Fund Award for her reporting on the Ebola outbreak in West Africa and also contributed to the New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning coverage of this epidemic. Kate Porterfield is a clinical instructor at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. She has a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Michigan, and she is the IMF's go-to expert for psycho psychological stress and trauma. For today's uh, webinar, we will leave 15 minutes at the end for questions. So if you have any during the webinar, please post them in the chat box. Any during the webinar, please post them in the chat box. Oh, you are saying there is a um, oh. echo? You are let me saying there is a um, echo? Okay, I'll try to use this. Let me know if this works better. It works better? Okay, I'll, I'll stop using my headphone. Sorry, guys. Um, so we will leave 15 minutes at the end of the questions. And if you have any question in the webinar, please post them in the chat box. I'll read them out later. Um, so um, now let's just uh, dig in. Um, first to Rebecca. Um, 
Um, in this webinar, we will hear uh, recent lessons and best practices on covering epidemics and uh, pandemics from global journalists. But Rebecca, you are a historian of medicine and public health. So I think we'll start with you about lessons we should be learning from history. What you are seeing right now in the US and how do we interpret it from the historical perspective? And um, how did the media cover this, pandem uh, this kind of uh, um, pandemics in the past? Well, thank you for organizing all of this, Jen, and thank you everyone out there for joining us. Um, historians have really different views about how long you have to wait for something to become history. Um, but I'm in the camp where if it happened five minutes ago, it's history. So we can actually start talking about this particular epidemic is history and certainly looking about it in historical context and in relationship to other epidemics. Um, in the United States, something that's really struck me so far is corporate communication. And that's often better than city, state, or county, or federal communication about COVID-19. And already there are historians out there asking people to send them all the emails and texts they've been getting from businesses. Um, and I think there'll be some really great research about this uh, in the future. In terms of themes um, and how the media you know, is treating the, uh, this outbreak now and how it's compared to the past, um, you can see on the next slide that people have always been asking for cures. Um, that's a really common theme. Figure out how to advance the slides here for a second. Uh, um, so this is a uh, caricature drawing from uh, the, a cholera outbreak in the 1830s from London. So, you know, this idea that people are always looking for the answer for the cure here, they're uh, crowding a bunch of pharmacists um, uh, looking for that. That is a theme that we often see in pandemic and pan after pandemic and something the media is often covering. Num another common theme on the next slide um, is the hunt for the source of the disease. And so here again, from that same cholera epidemic, uh, you can see them parroting the London Board of uh, Health, trying to sniff out because they believe that cholera is caused by bad smells at the time. So sniff out the source of cholera. And hunting or thinking about the source of disease is a space where I think journalists really need to stop and take a beat and take a breath because often the, uh, hunting for the source of disease or trying to report on it reinforces and exacerbates existing stereotypes based on race, gender, sexuality, and class. Uh, it is often a rush in the media to report blame or assign blame. And I want to talk about a few historic cases of that. And I just want to warn everyone there is racist imagery ahead as part of this. Um, so in the next slide, we have an example from the San Francisco literary magazine, The Wasp that blame Chinese immigrants for malaria, smallpox, and leprosy in the city, not because there is any evidence that Chinese immigrants were bringing these diseases into the community, but rather because of existing anti-Chinese uh, stereotypes and bias that, uh, you know, the sentiment that uh, the white rich elite who were reading this magazine already had against the Chinese is being brought in with this image and placing the blame on the Chinese community, which of course is something that we're seeing echoes of now, um, and especially in the United States with our current administration um, and members of the Republican Party trying to lay the blame for this epidemic at the feet of the Chinese, again, unfairly. Um, and so you can see those historical connections. And then for the next example I wanna talk about, um, this is from one of Hearst's New York magazines about Mary Malone, who you probably better know as Typhoid Mary. She was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid. She did infect people and was the source of several epidemics, but she's not the only asymptomatic carrier in the city of New York at the time or in the United States. The reason why she is singled out for isolation is complicated, but she is an Irish immigrant woman who is cooking um, in rich homes. So there is issues of immigration status, gender and class that uh, lead to her initial quarantine. The press really plays on these issues and you can see sort of across the top talking about the fact that she is mostly harmless, which is something the health department called her, yet the most dangerous woman in America. And so this duality of the asymptomatic carrier, which again, we're seeing now since asymptomatic carriers are part of the issue with COVID-19 as well. But you know, taking a moment to think about, well, how are you actually portraying the people who are asymptomatic carriers? 
um, and for them, they feel fine, but they are actually spreading disease. And then the last example that I just want to bring up from history is um, this is the cover of the New York Post from 1987 um, about the concept of patient zero um, and AIDS. Uh, this, uh, his sexuality really made for a juicy story for journalists. So 1987, we're well past the age of grid. Um, it is HIV AIDS. We're well into the point where we know that it is not just gay men who get um, HIV and AIDS. But yet, this story keeps playing out in the media, and the sexuality angle becomes a big one for journalists. And we know that even at the time that he's not patient zero, he's patient O, he's not the first person in the United States um, or the first person to have AIDS. And to this day, we're still dealing with the fallout of the concept of patient zero, the concept of typhoid Mary. Um, and it's something that you're already starting to see in reporting or in headlines around COVID-19 of saying, this person's patient zero, this person's a typhoid Mary. And so it's something I want, and I know we'll come back to, but thinking about as a journalist, how are you presenting these issues? And is it just making issues of race, class and gender, sexuality worse and exacerbating health inequities? Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I will just uh, say we will uh, circle back to her uh, to ask her more about uh, effective communications on COVID-19 at the end of this discussion. So let's turn next uh, to Jen Lee. Um, Jen, can you um, talk about uh, your experience since the beginning of uh, following this pandemic when it surfaced in China? And can you uh, describe uh, when you did you got it on this beat and how did you start reporting on this? Sure. So I first got on this beat, I would say in late January, when actually no one uh, would have foreseen this crisis, this virus would have um, developed into this like full blown crisis. So um, I started getting on this beat um, because I'm the only Milan Chinese person in my bureau in Hong Kong. So I feel it was really natural for me to take on it. And then because I can navigate Chinese social media and um, other platforms to pick up information quite easily. So then I really just started reporting on this from a technology angle because this is my beat. So basically one of the very first stories I did was how some strategic games about pandemic started getting popular in China around late January. That was exactly the time when people in China started realizing something was wrong. So then you, you could say some games like Plague Inc. and uh, some other similar games just starting to like uh, topping the charts in China on iOS. So that was one of the very first few stories I wrote. But since then, I have found it was almost impossible for me to not to focus on coronavirus related stories so, because every day there is some new development. So I just like I just went on to report on a very wide range of stories. So I just like didn't choose to only focus on tech. So I wrote about um, how some Chinese people have compared this public health crisis uh, with Chernobyl moment uh, in the 1980s and how some people have um, kind of been dis dislocated in China. Although they are Chinese people, uh, but they're still like, I gave them name like coronavirus refugees because they can't, uh, go back to their own house because of very strict travel restrictions China has imposed for containing the virus. And I also uh, did an interview with a citizen journalist uh, from China whose name is Chen Shi, who is actually gone missing shortly after I talked with him. So uh, I would say I've done a really wide range of stories and, and I didn't really have a choice. I just need to like, every day I wake up and there are new developments and I need to follow up with some of them. Yeah, um, so can you talk about, because I know you have a tech reporting uh, background and know a lot of uh, journalists right now uh, probably have to pick up the COVID-19 beat. Um, as a tech reporter, uh, without a health reporting history, how did you navigate that? How did you quickly uh, pivot to health coverage and pick up the beat really quickly and find your own voice on that? Mm -hmm. I would say it was really difficult because I don't have the professional knowledge like people like Rebecca or maybe other uh, experts who actually have been studying this topic. So I would say uh, from the very beginning, uh, I was struggling with the massive amount of information that I receive every day about the coronavirus uh, on social media as well as from Chinese and English language media. 
So I think gradually I just try to get into the seat by reading loads of coverage uh, from my colleagues and um, from like the Times and uh, from both Chinese and English language media. And I have to say some Chinese media have been doing a fantastic job in uh, explaining things to us uh, about uh, the origin of the virus or um, they've done interviews with some frontline medical workers who actually told us about how this thing has evolved into this like full-blown full blown crisis. And also uh, we have seen like uh, very crucial knowledge from key experts from China who are actually uh, working on the front line. So that is a crucial way for me to gradually get into the beach, although I still have like, loads of things that I need to learn currently. So I would say, I think it was um, after almost half a month into my reporting, into the speed, I started to feel I can find my own voice. I, I would say I can find my own angle to the stories because um, since I'm not on the ground and uh, court is definitely not as big as the Times or the Post or other big media outlets out there. So I would just mostly try to, and those big publications, they would have like hundreds of people working on the story. So I think, um, Try to, uh, in a way, I uh, because I both kind of want to compete with them, but also want to find my own angles to the story. So I just start to, to try to um, discover what are the angles that haven't been covered by the big newspapers. What are the non-mainstream stories? What are the people the the big outlets haven't talked with? So, um, for example, I wrote about a story, uh, I think in February, about how some Chinese cities trying to flash out coronavirus pa uh, patients, potential coronavirus uh, patients by stopping the sale of uh, cough and fever meds. So that was a very actually small announcement in some local newspapers. But somehow I came across the announcement on the newspapers. And then I also found there was almost no major media outlet pick it up at the time when I was writing. But whereas I think this was a very important example to show people how determined China was to fight the virus, but also how some people in China might be paying a heavy price for the very aggressive measures. So then this, this is one example, like how do I find my own angle into uh, the speech? And also when I was talking with uh, Chen Tu Shi, the citizen journalist I mentioned previously, I, I actually knew he was also in touch with maybe some uh, reporters from some major news outlets um, who are reporting on the ground. But then, because those journals didn't choose to talk with him, but then I just realized he was doing a very important job because he was um, shooting videos in Wuhan where the virus uh, was first discovered, and he was uploading the videos to YouTube to tell people what's really happening on the ground. So then I just did a phone call with him and got some first time information from him. So I think it's very important to. Um, just try to uncover the things, maybe let's say conventional, traditional media that haven't paid much attention to. That is great. Um, great suggestions. Um, have you encountered any like a main challenges um, reporting wise? Like your team are not reporting from the field and you're in Hong Kong and Hong Kong is actually impacted very early as well. Um, what are the main challenges you faced? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think first challenge definitely is um, how well prepared we are as a newsroom. So Quartz uh, has headquarters in New York, but uh, we also have this small bureau uh, in Hong Kong where I'm working for, and we also have offices in Mumbai and in London. So in the very beginning, I have to say, I, I think none of us uh, was very well prepared because like um, no one would have expected this to happen. So um, gradually, we were just trying to talk more with each other across bureaus, and I would reach out to people in London, and they would reach out to me as well. I, and my New York, New York colleagues would also ask me some questions about the coronavirus, uh, if they want to seek Chinese reactions as well. So I would say how well prepared is definitely the first challenge uh, I'm facing, and maybe uh, the whole newsroom is facing as well. And the second challenge would be what kind of information do we choose to report? So I think there was a very good point Rebecca just mentioned, like how can media try to avoid um, 
stereotyping people or just like labeling people or labeling a race or um, a country or even um, some like certain groups. So I think it's very difficult because uh, every day we are, every day um, we wake up and we're receiving new information and sometimes on the same day there could be two or three breaking news happen on the same day in China about the coronavirus. So then, but in the same time, I, I would have to consider, try to avoid sensationalizing the story too much and try not to just do the news for the sake of traffic. So honestly, I think journalists love traffic, media outlets love traffic, uh, because we kind of like, we, we definitely want our stories to be read. But also, I would ask myself constantly what kind of stories we choose to report would that kind of reinforce the stereotype of a certain group of people? So that's the first challenge I'm faced, or that's the second challenge I'm faced with. And I would say the third one is, as you said, I'm not on the ground. And um, Ford hasn't sent any reporters to Wuhan because we probably we wouldn't be able to get a journalist face as well. Um, so most of the time, I just try to find people on Chinese social networks because that's where the first time information will come from. And every day I would browse posts on Weibo, which is like China's equivalent of Twitter. And every day I would just go on the, the social media platform. I would try to um, just following up some posts and try to start talking to people. And I think one thing I've been finding very surprisingly is how open people have become in China. So let's say maybe even uh, a month ago, when I try to reach out to people on Weibo, they would be quite cautious because they don't know who they're dealing with. They've never talked with English language media and they don't know uh, what the consequences could be. But now I think lots of people have lived through really tragic times in China and especially for those in Wuhan. And so they have also feel the importance of having a free media and having someone who could actually tell their stories truthfully. So now I just finding they're being much more willing to talk and they don't even care because uh, that I work for English language media. So I think that's a really nice thing. But then this also leads to another challenge I'm faced, which is how do I protect them? So because previously people would always say there is a so-called red line in China, like you know what topics we touch and what kind of topics we don't. Um, so in a way, we thought um, if we didn't touch certain topics, maybe we were safe which is definitely not something as journalists we should be doing because um, we shouldn't allow ourselves to do self-censorship in the first place. But again, this days, um, like no one really knows where the right line is. So when I talk with those people, ordinary Chinese citizens, they actually, I think lots of them actually don't know what kind of risks they're taking. So the responsibility is on me to protect them. So I would, Sometimes I would just use their English name. If they have one, I would use their English name and their Chinese surname. So it would be really hard for the authorities to identify them. Or I would just like um, not write about their specific um, location or which company they work for. So I think it's really a struggle because you would want to give readers as much context as possible. So readers wouldn't, would know that you are not lying or you didn't make this person up. But on the other hand, how do you make sure the information you gave wouldn't be used by the authorities against the citizens is another um, problem. So I would say those are the major challenges I am faced right now. Thank you, Jen. Um, let's turn to Nadia. Um, Nadia is currently um, reporting in Italy and thank you for joining us at this time. I know you're on assignment today. Um, yeah. Even though it doesn't look like it. <laughs> but I, yeah, the easiest way to do this was to pop by my house, uh, the call. So, um, yeah, um, so Nadia, um, can, uh, can you describe a little bit of situation for you and uh, you're still actively working, how are things going? Um, just that. Yeah, um, yeah, so I've been working on this story only about, uh, I would say a week. Um, quite exhausting, <laughs> kind of uh, news coverage, um, you know, filing twice a day. And, um, you know, it's, we, we're able to move around as journalists. Um, 
you know, you might get stopped by the police, but we're, uh, you know, have a good reason to be moving around there. You know, they're giving a lot of fines to people. You know, I'm doing a lot of work on sort of the emptying out of Rome, which is quite a unique um, situation, just because it's probably the most um, iconic tourist city in the world. And it's pretty um, almost disturbing to see it empty. And um, so that's kind of the perspective I've been focusing on, uh, but I've also been um, close to some of the hospitals where people are arriving who are sick. And in Rome, we're, we're now, it's, you know, the, the virus is moving south. So we are kind of actually in the, it's peaking at the moment. So it's a pretty stressful time, even though the numbers are still somewhat low. Um, but, you know, the, the idea is that it just will keep moving south. And we haven't hit the peak yet. Um, and now they've opened three hospitals. So it's it's stressful in the work uh, mode. It's stressful in a personal way, um, just because the enemy is so unknown and you take the precautions uh, that you have to take. But at the same time, you know, there's no guarantees. So, um, uh, and I think it's, 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 I think it's very challenging visually how to, how to put a face on this and keep yourself safe and, you know, um, it's, it's, it's really hard to get, to get access into the hospitals and then you have to, uh, decide if you want to take that risk and how you would take that risk too. So, yeah, yeah so it's, it's going, um, and it's right, I'm right in the thick of it. So this is a very poignant, um, webinar, um, but, uh, hopefully it will pass quickly. Yeah, great. Um, so um, you covered Zika in Latin America in the past, and I'll show some uh, images from Nadia's uh, previous reporting. Um, like, um, obviously, Zika and uh, COVID-19 are very different. Um, but just uh, from a personal perspective, are, um, like, are there um, things that you can relate in between? And uh, um, can you talk a little bit about your Zika reporting as well? Yeah. Um... I think the the for me the the difference is that I covered Zika in in El Salvador, which is uh, one of the most dangerous countries in Latin America and um, or most violent. And so there was, I think that the the Zika was was a threat, and it was the story was about that, um, but it was also kind of about the the threat of violence to the women I was photographing. And what I ended up realizing is that Zika was the, the least of their worries. So it kind of also eclipsed my worries, my personal worries. Um, you know, I, I kept myself as safe as I could, um, but it's, it, it, what I found that was um, more, that these women had more um, on their minds and bigger problems than, a disease they knew little about. And so that's kind of the perspective I tried to take is, um, you know, what, what's it like to be a woman pregnant in El Salvador in the time of Zika is more kind of the way I looked at it. So that was my approach. And, you know, the differences are uh, Zika at the time, even though there was little known about the, the consequences um, to your body. If you got it, it seemed that the symptoms were quite mild and really um, were affecting pregnant women mostly. And I had, I had just given birth uh, about a year, it was a year, yeah, my daughter was a year old. So I had two kids, my daughter was a year old. And I was a little bit worried about um, you know, bringing, bringing it home, um, because we didn't know much about it and, in, you know, infecting my kids somehow, we didn't know exactly if it could be transmitted in the beginning. Um, but I think the difference is, is, is that you didn't see, I mean, you saw these grave consequences with the babies being born, but you didn't see the level of death and, um, you know, destruction of the body that you're seeing with COVID now. And I think, that, and, and so I think that there's, for me, there's a feeling, a much stronger feeling uh, or, of, 
uh, urgency around security. And, you know, with Zika, uh, I took a lot of precautions with um, re bug repellent, not going to places with still water and where I knew that there might be clusters of mosquitoes, um, not going out at certain times in the morning, especially where I knew that um, they would be prevalent and using spray religiously all over clothes, body, everything. Um, COVID, it's mask, although, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about whether the mask can really keep you safe and it's so easy to, you know, contaminate yourself with it. And then um, hand gel, but, you know, it's just, it's a lot of washing hands, gel, and hoping for the best as Jane probably knows. <laughs> yeah, um, just a lot of you are asking about safeties um, in the question box. And I just yeah. want to mention that uh, uh, IMF is a member of uh, um, ACOS Alliance, ACOS, and also we are a member of the JID, uh, Journalism in Distress uh, Network. Um, I would really recommend everyone to check out the CPJ's uh, or partner organizations um, guide, safety guide, as well as the IJNet has put on some uh, really good uh, resource uh, about safety as well. Um, but I'll still ask this to Nadia that um, how did you uh, keep yourself as a photographer when you need to be so close to the scene? Um, do you clean your camera as well? Like those kind of questions and yes. also you know, you have a portfolio with uh, covering people in a really vulnerable situation. Um, so can you share some tips on how did you have access and how you, um, or like how, um, how, how you um, sh uh, share those stories with uh, um, our listeners who might never had that kind of opportunity in the past? Okay, so do you want me to talk more about the security first and then? Uh, yeah, yeah the let's start question. with okay. the safety. So the, yeah, the, sa the safety um, uh, mask, uh, N95 or similar mask, which is the one that can stop the particles from the COVID virus. Um, other masks aren't adequate. And, but unless you're sick, um, if you're sick with like a cough or something, um, a mask that would, um, you know, stop any fluids from, from getting out. But the, you know, the, the particular mask that can stop um, COVID particles from entering is what you need. Um, and about, although I'm, you know, I wear it for protocol um, and, and psychologically, but as I said, you know, I've read a lot of articles about how you can easily contain, you know, contaminate yourself by not, uh, you know, by taking it off for a moment and then somehow contaminating yourself. So I think the most important things, as everybody probably already knows, because everybody's reading this in the media, is hand washing religiously and gel. And I do, yeah, I do, I go around in my car, my own car, because Rome's deserted and every, you know, you can drive around everywhere, park anywhere. And so I'm in my own car. Um, I don't, so I'm not really around anybody else. And I, I use um, hygienic wipes on my car a lot during the day and on, yeah, on my, on my camera and things that um, I touch often. I leave my shoes and stuff outside of the house. Um, I don't bring, I try not to bring in things inside of the house. Um, you know, a lot of the so stuff is, you know, there's different theories. A lot of stuff is unknown about transmission of the virus. So whatever precautions you can take are, best, especially, um, you know, not to endanger your loved ones. And um, yeah, and, and so about the hospital, um, I personally, I haven't felt comfortable going into a hospital, even in like a hazmat suit. Um, so I keep my distance and I've been shooting um, people arriving in the hospital in the ambulance from a distance. So um, there's quite a bit of difference, distance in between me and people with the virus. Um, I've seen photographers who have gone pretty close into, into the tents, and that's just a personal call. Um, so right now I'm keeping my distances, and so I feel, you know, that's everybody has a comfort level. And um, about photographing vulnerable people in vulnerable situations, um, 
Yeah, I think that that's definitely, uh, uh, I've done a lot of that in my work. You know, my a lot of my work is about uh, human rights violation and um, yeah, people generally in vulnerable situations or suffering. And I think that the key is really to spend time with people, um, to really take the time, you know, not just, uh, and that's going to pay off. And that, that is also going to make you um, sort of, I, I like to say, fall in love with your subjects in a way, because you really become interested in, in what they're going through. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, of course I've done work where, you know, it's a, it's a breaking news situation and I'm not able to spend a lot of time with people, but I always try to find an intimate connection with people visually or just even in, a, you know, a, a moment's exchange, uh, if I don't have all the time, but I, I do, I do prefer to take a lot of time and document people and stay in their homes and, um, get to know them and and I think on some level it's also really helpful for them to have somebody to talk to about these things and have somebody around that that cares about it um, and they you know I, I look at it as like a collaboration in a way that they're opening up their lives to you they're giving that to you and so that you have to make the best of it and show it and it's your duty at that point to show it Thank you. Um, and I think um, um, some people are asking about how do you get the story, visual stories to be published and all that. I think for Zika, can you talk about the one that you published with so many outlets like uh, uh, Guardian and uh, Nat Geo? Um, did you pitch first with a writer or like a, I understand now probably you're getting commissions? Yeah, um, right now I'm on, yeah, I'm on assignment with the New York Times. And, but with Zika at the point, um, at that point, I was, I had pitched the story to, um, to Harper's Magazine with whom I work a lot with and um, at the, if they didn't answer me for a really long time. And then it happened, so happened that a writer was working on something similar in El Salvador because the idea was like, where do you go where there's no abortion is possible during the Zika crisis? I think that was what the idea was, is that the women that have really no rights to, um, and, and have very little control over their reproductive lives too, um, with the violence that they live through. And so we, I pitched it and then um, didn't hear anything. And then this writer uh, pitched something similar. And then so it worked out that we went at the same time. And then that allowed me to, um, you know, start, get a really strong start with the work. And then I went back um, with, on an IWMF fellowship. And then that, and I ended up collaborating with Nina Strolik, who's a um, National Geographic writer, so who was also on the trip. So that kind of led to, and then I went back again. <laughs> I've been back four times in the, and won some grants on the story and became really committed to the story. Um, but it started with that first assignment, basically. And I, I, you know, it was something that I had pitched and then it just happened to work out with, yeah, their writer. Thank you. Just wanted to let everyone know that Nadia is still on assignment today, so she will need to yes. leave us after her <laughs> speech. Um, but uh, thank you, Nadia. Uh, for thank you, everybody. And uh, keep uh, yourself safe and your family safe there. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Okay. Um, so let's next turn to Claire. Um, so Claire, um, I'd like to ask you some uh, similar questions. Um, how did you, um, how did you uh, cover Ebola from Liberia? Um, uh, not just as a breaking news, because I know um, you worked on a lot of investigative and long form issue. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, sure. Well, I, I'd been living in Liberia for three years before the Ebola outbreak, um, you know, happened. So I think that um, it was it was pretty sort of, you know, helpful. Um, and I understood that there were a lot of issues at play um, during the outbreak. There was a, a big sort of lack of trust in the government. Um, you know, there was the trauma from the civil war. Um, you know, there were already existing issues with the healthcare system. 
uh, there was a lot of mistrust and sort of problems with corruption. So I think, you know, early, early on, I mean, I, I was very sort of, I was working all the time, um, you know, and sometimes giving feeds um, to different outlets um, and also sort of, you know, working on stories. But I think early on, I, sorry, pardon. Early on, I, um, I sort of started putting my sights on sort of a few stories that would, um, uh, you know, would, um, uh, you know, um, that I'd like to pursue and, um, and then sort of, I guess, started finding connections and links um, early on. Yeah. Um, so Ebola is uh, such a deadly virus compared with the COVID-19's uh, fatality rate. Uh, were you scared and uh, how did you protect yourself um, in the field? Sure. So I think that, you know, we were in sort of quite a similar situation, um, you know, to a lot of reporters who were um, reporting on COVID-19. Obviously, the fatality rate um, for Ebola is a lot higher, but there was a lot that was unknown about how the virus was transmitted and how you uh, how you got infected. Um, you know, and early on, um, basically, uh, you know, we were informed that you, you know, constantly needed to wash your hands. Um, we'd wash them with chlorine solution. Um, you know, when, when we'd go out sort of near Ebola treatment centres, um, you'd wear gum boots um, or what you, you guys call them rain boots, um, you know, and um, you'd wear those there and you'd spray, have them sprayed down with chlorine. Um, and you'd basically just be very careful about touching anything. Um, you know, getting too close to people who are infected. And I think that, you know, with um, the Liberian government um, earlier on in the Ministry of Health, you know, you had very sort of, you were able to access, you know, holding centres and go into places, but they shut that down pretty, um, you know, quickly because, you know, it was, I guess, seen to be sort of the best best measure because of the sort of danger of being around you know, people very in close, very, very close proximity to um, to people who were infected. But um, but yeah, basically hand sanitizer. Um, you know, uh, washing your hands with chlorine solution, not getting too close to people, and then also doing things. You know, I think it's really important for you to keep an eye on your own health. So taking your own temperature, um, just seeing that you know, you know, monitoring yourself and seeing if you have certain symptoms, and then. You know, we'd um, do things like take anti-malarials because the symptoms were often sort of similar, um, you know, to Ebola. So, you know, I think that one recommendation for COVID-19 has been getting a flu shot potentially. Um, so, I, yeah, I think that if, if there's any way that you can take precautions that can sort of rule out um, the possibility that it's something else, um, you know, I think, I think that's really important. Thank you, Claire. Um, so um, you as a freelancer um, have worked for many different outlets during the uh, Ebola outbreak and afterwards. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, like how, how do you work for several outlets at once or like uh, uh, make rapid decisions just day to day at the front line? And what do you decide to report on? What do you decide to skip? Um, sure. I mean, often I, I think that, um, you know, particularly, I mean, there, there was sort of certain choices you could make in terms of stories, but I think often you were sort of folk, uh, often following sort of the latest outbreak or, you know, if there had been a sort of screw up or a mistake made, you'd be um, following that. Um, but, you know, I think that as, as sort of... Um, cases started to decline you could often sort of make you know as a freelancer you know I was often able to make more of a choice about what I was um, pursuing but I think that um, that I think sort of I guess you know in the early stages it was very much so focusing on you know where the latest outbreak was you know if a burial team had been attacked or if something had had, had happened or if health workers you know at a particular hospital um, you know were being uh, um, harassed you know that's that that was sort of I guess where you'd go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to ask a little bit um, about the cultural appropriations. Uh, how do you stay away from the traditional, like in quotes, and or like frankly toxic narrative of Africa and Ebola at this, that time? And um, like, can you talk about how you uh, portray people in writing? And have you made any mistakes that you would um, caution others to not make this time? 
Sure. I mean, I think for me, very early on, I was a bit sort of hesitant about reporting on the outbreak because I felt like it was this very sort of stereotypical story about Africa and disease. But I think that as it became sort of apparent that, um, you know, the scale of the outbreak, um, you know, was, was, you know, going to be really significant and a lot of lives um, would be lost, I started um, pursuing, it, um, you know, stories uh, on on that outbreak, I think that um, I think that one thing that um, that really helps is um, you know because I'd lived there for um, you know three years, I had connections with communities. So, for example, West Point, which is a community that was that was quarantined for ten days, um, you know there was a military ordered um, quarantine. I had lots of connections there, and I sort of understood the community um, dynamics. And I think that um, you know I think particularly when you're writing about um, you know different different cultures. Um, you know, you need to sort of understand that, you know, people have different ways of understanding health problems or making sense of things around them and to not ridicule that or make, um, you know, stereotypes about people. And I think, you know, it's just very important to, to listen to people, um, you know, and where they're coming from and, and what they're saying. So I think that um, I think that that was sort of, um, you know, uh, um, a sort of you know any advice I'd give is sort of you know find find people that you can establish connections with and you can follow um, you know over a significant period of time um, and um, and I think that you know in terms of advice uh, you know ab about sort of things to avoid you know and I think this is a really difficult one as well during a, a chaotic epidemic but I think that um, or a pandemic I think that um, you know, during the Ebola outbreak, um, there were a lot of people, for example, who were very sick and outside the front of Ebola treatment units. And, you know, at, in the early stages, it's it felt as though, and, you know, there was good evidence to indicate this, that, um, you know, that the government was trying to hide the scale of the problem and that it wasn't taking the problem seriously. But I think, um, you know, when you've got very sort of sick, vulnerable people outside the front of Ebola treatment units. And, um, you know, there's a lot of stigma, you know, I think as, you know, uh, you know, particularly when it comes to images um, and also, you know, even sort of writing or filming, I think that, you know, you need to really sort of think about how sensitively to, how, how to approach that sensitively. And also just, you know, even to think about issues of consent and, and so on. And, you know, I, I don't have a, um, definitive answer as to, you know, like how to solve all of these sort of ethical dilemmas or how to sort of approach, approach, um, you know, um, this or, you know, like a, a set of guidelines. But I think that, um, that reporters definitely need to be um, very sensitive to the fact that people are vulnerable, they're ill, they're panicking and they're frightened um, and, you know, um, how best to sort of, you know, establish trust and, you know, sort of get that um, sort of, um, you know, some kind of like, consent. Thanks, really. Yeah, um, um, my, um, this question to you, Claire, and also later to Jen, I'll ask Jen this question as well, is what kind of mental health challenges did you face during your health crisis reporting um, or like after the reporting? Mm, I think, um, I think, yeah, during the reporting, I mean, I think it was, it was a very sort of, it was a very surreal time. And I think that there was this, um, I think what was difficult is, you know, basically the, the image of the Ebola outbreak was people walking around in hazmat suits. And I think that, you know, like a lot of family and friends just thought that everyone was dressed in this kind of PPE hazmat suit. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really like that. So, you know, you had to sort of negotiate the panic of, you know, family and friends and, and so on. But, you know, there was, you know, I think that, being being around people who are very sort of scared and frightened and feel very threatened um, for sort of long periods of time. I mean, that was difficult. Also being around people that you can't sort of like comfort and touch and help, you know, because West Africa is a very tactile place. And, you know, often if you're sort of interviewing someone, you know, and they're feeling, you know, um, feeling sad or feeling in pain, you might sort of touch them on the arm or, you know, like in a lot of cultures, people do that. But I think that, um, I think that that was a really sort of difficult thing is not being able to comfort people. And then also, you know, um, uh, people asking you or for answers or, you know, for, for information, I think is often, 
yeah, pe people sort of, I guess, ask you questions in order to make sense of what's happening around them and looking to you for answers, I think is a, is a really sort of difficult and, and, challenging, um, and challenging thing as well, I think, when you're um, reporting on this. And, and I think, yeah, the, the aftermath, you know, of, of an outbreak is also really, um, yeah, there are a lot of difficult things to, um, to report on. And I think that often it's just like, it, you know, it doesn't hit people exactly sort of like the scale of what's happened around, around them, you know, and as a reporter, it doesn't sort of really um, hit you until, because you're working all the time, basically, until, until later. And I think it's really, yeah, it's really important to take care of yourself and um, especially also, um, you know, for the sake of your work as well, to ensure that you're kind of able to listen to people and able to have, you know, like connect and um, speak to people empathetically. You know, I think that it's 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 really important, not just for yourself, but for, for your work as well, to to take care of your, um, you know, mental well-being, your health, everything. Yeah, I want to turn to Jen a little bit um, to talk about your uh, mental health journey in the reporting, as I assume, because we were both Chinese, we probably went through a similar journey. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think for me, the challenge is uh, the mental stress mostly comes from the fact that I need to keep up with all the like misery from people in Wuhan, because they, some of them keep posting like desperate cries for help almost I think in February there was a period whenever I went on Weibo and I just saw like hundreds of posts coming out from people and um, they were asking whether there are empty hospital beds or which hospital could uh, take in their very ill um, uh, family members and you will say uh, all kinds of like um, desperate cries for help. So every day I have to browse the post, but in the same time, although I did reach out to lots of them, but in the same time, you don't really know how to ask them the questions that you want to know because they might have a family member who was dying. So I don't even know how to start a conversation with them anymore. And then also beyond that, you, you, I have to also verify um, the information people are providing, which is another challenge because they probably already going through this extremely difficult time. But as a journalist, you still have to make sure they are telling you the true stories. So that would be, that's a really, really huge challenge for me. So I think uh, most of my mental stress will come from um, uh, that part. Absolutely. So next uh, we're gonna turn to uh, Kate. Uh, Kate is a uh, um, speciality, uh, her speciality is on uh, trauma and uh, uh, trauma related with journalism. So um, first, uh, Kate, can you just, uh, um, Tell us what do you hear from Jen, from Claire, from uh, Nadia, and you think that's uh, worth talking about? Yeah, definitely. So can you all hear me now? Yeah. Can Great. you speak louder? Sure, sure. I mean, first of all, I think what I just want to say is um, thank you to Jen and to IWMF for doing this. I mean, even just sitting here for these 50 minutes, I found it incredibly helpful. I'm not a journalist. I'm a psychologist. Um, you know, Rebecca putting it in the historical context, I found really helpful. And then the stories, you know, stories from Jane and Nadia and Claire, um, so incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, let me just answer your question, Jen. Um, what I'm here, because I did actually like really notice things jumping out w with the language that these incredible journalists were using. Um, so, you know, I noticed this idea about scapegoating, right? Rebecca points out the idea of scapegoating. And um, the, the lens I want to kind of bring for my part today is just understanding what is traumatic stress and what does traumatic stress do to the human organism. And so when, when Rebecca right out of the gate was talking about scapegoating, I just thought of like the power of that word that it means basically victimizing. Um, and that there's already a component we're talking about within a couple minutes of this topic of people being victimized in some way. Um, and that's really painful and that's really distressing. Um, you know, Jane's language jumped out at me when she talked about coronavirus refugees. Again, you know, a word refugee that has a lot of um, trauma wrapped up in it. It means loss of home and safety and protection and systems. And, you know, th that this current crisis um, is creating, again, a, a, a generation of people 
um, with tremendous, tremendous losses and stresses. Um, hearing about Nadia, like the first thing Nadia said, actually, I think one of the earliest, one of the first sentences she said was, it's been exhausting. Um, the, and uh, the urgency of it has taken a toll. And she talked about it's a stressful time, both for work and professional, I'm sorry, work and personal. So, you know, the language that we use when we talk about what we're working on, it's showing, right? It's showing how hard this experience is to try to tell the stories of, to take the photographs of. Um, I mean, the fact that Nadia said exhausting, it really touched me when I thought about her walking around in empty Rome, you know, trying to convey to people what's happened here to this beautiful place. Um, and she's saying, I'm tired, you know, it's tiring to my body and to, to my mind. And we have to listen to that language if we're going to get through this um, in our communities, our workplaces, our personal lives. We have to listen to the language we're all using because the language is how we humans um, make meaning and it's how we're trying to convey what we're feeling. Um, you know, Claire talking about um, the, the, the vulnerable, frightened, panicked people, you know, those words, vulnerable, frightened, panicked. Um, Claire said surreal, you know, surreal has to do with a disconnect between what we think really should be reality and what we're looking at. And again, when you think of what that does to your organism to be looking at a reality that is so different than what you think it should be or what you want it to be. And, you know, when Claire talked about that, it, uh, both, both in terms of the Ebola context, but also the present, um, the, the, it, it was very powerful. The panic of family and friends that she's seen people feeling threatened. I mean, again, the word threat, what that means to the individual who feels the threat is that it means a certain set of a kind of cascade of reactions are going to happen to that person to deal with the threat. And I can talk about that a little later if we have more time. I just want to say two more reactions um, that, that come from what you all have said. One was um, that when Claire said people are just trying to make sense of what's in front of them, you know, she said that about the Ebola crisis. And again, I found that very touching because I felt like Claire's perspective comes from she's there trying to tell this story. And what she sees in the Ebola crisis, at least, was people desperately trying to um, make meaning about what is happening to our world, right? What's happening to our people, to our bodies. And that is a very human process that no matter what is put in front of us, we have this brain up here that tries to make sense of it. And it's an incredible gift and strength we have. But as you all have talked about, it can also be toxic. And the way people make sense can be scapegoating, as Rebecca said, it can be alienating, it can be aggressive. You know, there's a lot of ways we make sense and make meaning that can be hurtful. So one of the things I really like to, to, to say to uh, people who are struggling in a trauma is that be attending to how you're making meaning, looking at your meaning making construct a little bit will help you. How am I making meaning of this right now? What am I, what am I doing about it in my mind and in my, my feelings? Um, because it will help you have more, uh, more of a sense of um, coherence to it if you understand how you're making meaning. I thought when Claire said that people were trying their best to make sense of what was happening with Ebola, even if their meanings might not have been the meanings we might have come up with, I thought that was really powerful. So that's kind of my, um, my, my assessment. I guess one more thing is that Claire said it hits you later. And I think that's another component of traumatic stress. And you know, I can talk to you guys if there's time about traumatic stress a little bit, but essentially, you know, we're an organism and our organism has to attend to and adapt to what comes at it. And what these journalists are telling us is that, you know, they're in the midst of um, conditions that are, that are so highly stressful and that the people they're reporting on, as well as themselves, are having to adapt to. And those adaptations, um, they cannot, they must not be... Um, ignored. You know, you have to attend to the adaptations that we have to make under stress or else they overpower you. So um, I can I can stop there, Jen. That was kind of a long answer on what I was hearing. Yeah. Um, so Kate, I want to ask you a little bit more on how to prepare for this, because we are just, in, at least in the US, we're kind of in the beginning stage of reporting on this. And uh, we will see more uh, traumatic events happening around the country. And with um, journalists that uh, who are not prepared or their newsroom are not prepared. So can you just offer some tips for journalists who are listening right now or editors, um, how to prepare themselves and also talk about how to prepare their newsroom? Yeah, I mean, again, I'm not an expert in organizational psychology. I'm not an expert in, uh, in newsroom structures. So I, I'm actually going to just speak really um, kind of broadly as a clinician. And again, I'm a clinician who works with people who have been traumatized. And so 
My, you know, my knowledge comes from working to understand and help people recover. I, I, but, and I do a fair amount of work with journalists. Um, so uh, what I want to say about that is that I think what's going to happen and what needs to happen is that well-being, sort of the concepts of well-being and the concepts of traumatic stress really at this point should be part of the fabric of a newsroom or the fabric of a news organization or, and they should be part of the vocabulary of those organizations. They should not just be these sidebar, you know, hey, don't forget self-care or, you know, it's a little stressful, take a break. It, you know, the, the, this, the kind of tools of journalism, you know, reporting well, uh, uh, Jane talking about protecting subjects, right? That's part of the skill and the ethics of being a great reporter. So reporting well um, and writing well and editing well, those are your guys' skill sets, right? But also what, what, what I think organizations and um, uh, you know, newsrooms need to start folding more into is a, is a practice of attending to traumatic stress, just like other things that those journalists need um, when they need resources. It's what is the skill set and the ethics that we need when facing this level of trauma out in the field. Um, and there's a slide up I'll talk about in one second, Jen. Um, go back a minute, actually, Jen, to the slide that just says biopsychosocial with the three images, if you can. I think it might be one of my first slides, um, if you can. No worries if you can. Um, what I think this would look like, by the way, for um, uh, newsrooms is a couple things. I think the first thing is we have to, there you go. So I think we have to understand that our organisms, us people walking around in these bodies, right, that are constructed of, uh, you know, skin and bones and nerves and organs, our organism is a biological organism. We're psychological beings with minds, you know, thoughts and feelings that come out of our, our, our brain, and we're social. We are constructed and evolved to deal with each other and to need and interact with each other. And that understanding of the biopsychosocial aspect of being a person is how we then can understand the biopsychosocial imprint of traumatic stress. And so to go back a quick second on newsrooms, and then I'm gonna, I'll, I'll pause. Um, you know, I think for newsrooms to, and news organizations to have a knowledge base, you know, what I would call a psychoeducational framework around what does traumatic stress do to people? Not just our subjects, which of course you are, as I as talked about today, very protective of your subjects, but also yourselves, our staff, our photographers, our editors, our interns, you know, the people out there telling these stories, absorbing these stories. What is the biopsychosocial impact on these folks of absorbing, seeing, witnessing this traumatic stress? And then the, the job is to create the structures in the news organizations and the practices that will address that biopsychosocial need, you know, whether that's work on pace, you know, defining the pace of work. Uh, peer support programs that can be built. I've talked to a lot of organizations about that. Uh, professional help that can be accessed. Um, dissemination of information, well-being exercises and well-being materials. Um, and then really ongoing conversations about the pace of work, boundaries to the work, where do we protect ourselves. Um, so these are the kind of things I think newsrooms that are, you know, first of all, I think newsrooms are doing this, some. Uh, and news organizations, but but building in a real um, vocabulary and structure around the fact that traumatic stress is part of this work. It's certainly part of COVID, but as you all have said, it's been part of many, many stories that you've been telling. Thank you, Kate. Um, uh, I, I also just want to give you a chance to talk about what are the stre uh, stress um, um, reactions, like the signs. And sure. at the same time, can you also mention a little bit of secondary trauma? Because I think a lot of us are experiencing this right now, not as the frontline yep. journalists, as the first respondent, uh, but we are actually uh, reading a lot of things and watching a lot of things online. Sure. So let me, I'm going to spend a couple minutes then on these slides. Um, so Jen, you can go ahead and, and go to the next slide. Um, you know, first of all, I think I, I'm not going to spend time defining traumatic stress, but you know, trauma essentially is a is an experience or experiences that overwhelm us. And they what trauma does is it it takes us from normal coping, that kind of um, you know tolerant zone that that I can do okay, I got it, my skills are working right now. It takes you out of that into my nervous system is having to react to this in with other. Um, strategies. So sometimes you think of these as what we call uproar reactions, which is your body turning up the, the temperature a bit. That's, you know, it's kind of like uh, uh, ramping up, right? The sympathetic nervous system takes charge. People, when you're in an uproar feeling, it's anxiety, 
heart racing, um, sweating, you know, and these could be things that are happening in a moment because something's scaring you, or they can happen after it's already happened and it returns to you kind of unbidden. And then shutdown reactions are more our body saying, you know, this, um, it's too much. You know, it's actually your brain and your body saying it's too much. I got to just shut things down. It's a parasympathetic response that's actually also mostly involuntary. Um, and when these reactions happen, it can be, again, in a moment of severe fear and lack of escape, lack of ability to escape. And so your body starts to really close down your perceptions, your pain, your consciousness. Sometimes it's called dissociation. Um, and these, so, the, so the reason I'm underscoring these nervous system reactions is because they're what our body does to adapt to stress. And it's why our body and our brain is an amazing, amazing set of organisms. But the problem is the imprint of trauma then is what comes after. So we've had this stress reaction kind of pumping through us either in some moments or chronically over time. And that biopsychosocial reaction starts to manifest itself in those nervous system reactions becoming kind of more part and parcel of our daily life. So this slide that's up right now is just some signs of, of the kinds of ways that the bio, the psycho, and the social part of our organism react to stress. So if you just take a look at those, I'm not gonna describe them all because they're pretty self-explanatory, uh, but that biological imprint of stress is very real, guys. It's very real. It can come with sleep problems, with fatigue, with real impairment of concentration and attention, um, an edginess or a, an on-edge feeling, like a clenched stomach or your heart feeling a little bit racy, feeling sweaty, uh, trouble breathing. Um, headaches, stomach problems, other kinds of chronic pain. Those can be signs that your body is manifesting um, the, the overload of stress. You know, and again, it's an adaptation, right? Everything our bodies does to deal with stress is trying to save us. And one of the things I want to say to everyone watching is, you know, thank your body, give your body a pat if it's getting you through this. Maybe sometimes you're not feeling that great. But you know, our bodies are real adaptation machines and they save us. And so part of meaning making that I like to say with my patients is um, thank your body for what it's doing well and the way it is helping you right now. Just again on the stress reactions a minute and then I'll pause, Jen. Um, the, the psychological stress reactions, again, some of them are probably pretty obvious. Feeling sad, feeling despair, feeling hopeless. Um, anxiety, I mean, I cannot tell you how much I'm hearing about anxiety. You know. This is what people are talking about, all of us. And that comes with the territory, the unknown that our, our journalists talked about, the sense of dread, foreboding. Um, and then another psychological stress reaction can really be that meanings start to change and you start to feel a sort of darkness in your meanings. This is never gonna get better. This is a sign of how bad humans are, you know, whatever the meaning is, that starts to turn into a darker, darker meaning. Um, troubling images and thoughts coming to us, uh, foreboding and then self attack just a minute on that you know self attack is actually a, a, a very common but very um, difficult symptom that comes out of getting overwhelmed with stress and what happens is that you know we humans seem to make meaning often by by first blaming ourselves or first turning pain in on ourselves and so during this to be saying to yourself uh, negative things or or things about ways you're failing is actually probably a sign of the, of the of stress that you need to kind of pause on and step back and notice that meaning making. Finally, the social piece again is about you know really everything from pulling away from people that we need to feeling angry and irritable with them to feeling misunderstood by people. Um, I've been. Uh, I've been trying to um, go viral with my teenagers by saying there's something I'm creating, um, a term called uh, the corona mismatch. And the mismatch is you're talking to someone and you're kind of in one place about it. You know, maybe you're feeling a little better that minute or you're just kind of not dwelling. And then they start telling you some terrible thing that they just heard or read. And you just start to sink like, oh, I just don't want to be talking to you right now. Um, and I think we're all having those mismatch conversations, right? And that's a social consequence of the traumatic stress of this material coming at us. The social consequence being, I feel disconnected from you right now. You're being hopeless and I'm needing some hope right now. So that, that stress reaction uh, is very real. And you know, later, I mean, I, I'm gonna, there's gonna be another webinar we're gonna do and, and it's pretty much ready to go about, about sort of strategies. Um, so Jin, you want me to say one more thing about strategies before, because I'm watching our yeah, time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so letting, just letting everyone know that Kate is working on a full length webinar over an hour. That's what I heard. Um, and uh, the Adam left will be helping her to distribute it after she finished. 
Um, so if you are uh, following us on social, probably you will see it popping up in the coming week. So if you go ahead, uh, Jen, on those slides a little uh, bit, uh, but I just want to say that self-assessment, stay on this one, is one of the first steps towards addressing trauma. And people who survive trauma and who heal you know, from it or through it are often people who've just, first of all, understood what did the trauma do to me? How did it affect me? And then what can I do when I feel that imprint? And so self-assessment is a tool I really recommend people to think about, and I'll talk about it more in this other webinar if anyone, um, uh, if it would be helpful. But the idea of self-assessment is that same model, bio, psycho, social. Okay, how am I doing? So, you, you know, bio, you can go through it pretty basic. Assess sitting with yourself. How am I doing physically? Do I have pain in my body? Do I have uneasiness? Um, there's a second slide on this, but let me just finish on this. Psychological, go ahead. Okay, good. That, keep it there, Jen. Am I rested? Am I fed? Am I drinking water? Am I being healthy in my, um, what I put in my body? Am I feeling pleasure? Is there any place I let myself feel pleasure? Going back to the first slide of this self-assessment too, uh, how, same assessment. What am I feeling emotionally? Can I name it? Can I sit and just sit with it? I don't have to say that's a bad feeling. That's not an okay feeling. I don't have to make it go away. Just saying, this is what I feel. You'd be amazed how much we don't do that. Um, recognizing my thoughts. I right now am thinking catastrophically. I'm noticing that I'm feeling bad and I'm thinking catastrophically. So feelings and thoughts are getting linked, right? Okay, maybe I should pause a second. Socially, who am I talking to? And what am I noticing about what I feel? When I talk to this person, I don't feel so good. When I talk to this person, I feel a little better. <laughs> you know, am I giving support? Am I giving support? That's a healing process. And am I receiving support? Um, the second, let me just go to that second part. Again, assessing. What feelings are causing me the most trouble? I'm under psychological now. And, and notice that last row. If you go across that row, it's got one word in, in, uh, in common, which is pleasure and positivity. So am I feeling pleasure? Am I bringing pleasure to my interactions with others or trying to take pleasure from it? So the last thing I'll say, because I, I, I do really want to be careful of time, Jen, and give everyone um, thoughts and time for questions. But the, the process of healing and dealing with traumatic stress, it's not an on-off switch. I'm not gonna suggest to you that like, hey, you do this and it's all gonna go away. We are in an extraordinary, unprecedented situation right now. So what you wanna do, thank you, this is a slide. You wanna be thinking about, I am gonna create a well-being practice for myself that starts with recognition that I'm biopsychosocial, that follows with a self-assessment process that I do each day and sometimes in a moment, and that then culminates in me really committing to a well-being practice that I'm going to build that is a biopsychosocial practice. And you notice pacing is down there as its own thing, which is how hard do I work? When do I take breaks? When do I stop with the material that I have coming at me? And when do I let pleasure into the, into the mix? And if you look at that practice, we'll talk about it more, um, but, but it's pretty self-explanatory, but it's not simple. So I want to make sure you guys got the difference. It's self-explanatory, but not simple. This is hard work to build a practice, and it actually takes discipline. But the discipline I'm hearing from these journalists, from all of you all out there doing this work, it's incredible, right? So this is just as, as important to your well-being, or to your um, professional job, you know, to be protecting yourselves, as is the actual work you're doing. I'll stop there. I have to unmute myself. <laughs> I want to go back to Rebecca a little bit. Um, Rebecca, can you just uh, um, let's let's really talk about digging in on the efficiency of uh, science communication. Uh, what are your recommendations, and how can um, journalists, especially the island math followers who are attending this uh, um, webinar, that who are women journalists around the world, to help? Uh, yeah, um, as Kate was just Can saying, you speak up a little bit. Oh, sorry. Um, as Kate was just saying, this is an unprecedented time in terms of the scale of COVID-19 and the severity of it. Um, and this is going to sound like really basic information, but when it comes to science communication, really the most important thing is communicating clearly and efficiently. And so it's about conveying the seriousness of this uh, using uh, scientific terms without getting too technical and without causing panic. And so, you know, I have lots of examples from history of the times where maybe one journalist will, you know, write an article saying, 
this thing's going to kill everyone on the planet and you know other journalists having to walk it back and it's about writing that fine line between you know clear efficient truthful communication and not causing a panic which is not easy to do and people can't always do perfectly um, one thing I like to remind people, especially right now with COVID-19, the situation is really fluid. We're getting new data every day. So you want to make sure that you are always open to these changes in your coverage. Um, for example, just yesterday, we got more information about the epidemiology of the disease in children um, and that there are more severe cases than they thought. Um, and so, you know, that means we need to change the way we're talking about the disease in children reporting about that. And that's okay. Right? It's okay to say, hey, we have new information, we need to modify the way we're talking about this and bring this new information to people. Um, if you are interested in keeping up on new reporting and new science about COVID-19, I'd really recommend Global Health Now, which is a newsletter out of Johns Hopkins. Uh, it covers a lot of uh, and compiles a lot of the great journalism that's going on right now. And then the other newsletter I recommend is SIDRAP which is Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy out of University of Minnesota. And it covers and compiles all the scientific information that's coming out. Um, so both of those are good follows um, if you wanna keep up to date. Um, as you all know, you should be talking to researchers. I'd recommend not just those who are working in human health, but also those working on zoonotic diseases, animal veterinary medicine. Um, I run a lot of science communication workshops that the message that comes out of them when I bring journalists and researchers together a lot of times is the journalists are like, oh, I was too afraid to go talk to um, the researchers. And the researchers say, I was too afraid to go talk to the journalists. I just want to recommend we are all people. Um, the worst thing you can do is when someone, if you contact someone, is they're going to say no or not respond to you. And so I want to encourage you, reach out to researchers. Um, people working in this field, working in related fields, um, a lot of times they don't know how to necessarily contact journalists or they're hesitant to contact journalists. Great relationships can be built, long lasting relationships that can last past this particular outbreak if you're someone who reports often on um, epidemic uh, and pandemic concerns and health. Um, it's a great time to build that. And of course, what will be no surprise to this audience of women journalists a lot more male researchers and scientists get quoted in stories than women or non-gender uh, binary people. And so please reach out and quote women researchers, non-gender binary researchers, trans researchers, um, and you know, uh, try and help equal up the score there. Um, another thing I just think that's important to report at the moment is call a false cure a false cure. Um, we know placebo effect is real. Some people can benefit from placebos, are genetically able to. That's really great when you're reporting about pain and chronic illness, not great when you're reporting about infectious diseases. And also remember that vaccines and medications take a really long time to test. So be really cautious and don't overpromise when you're reporting about potential um, vaccines or medication. Something might work in a non-human animal model that's not gonna work in humans, or might work in a really small population that you know is not going to work when you get to a larger population. There was just one this morning about uh, HIV medication that they were testing in China as possible um, treatment for COVID-19 that didn't work when they took it into a larger population. So just remember not to overpromise when you're reporting on those issues. Yeah, um, Rebecca, can you expand a little bit about the targeted communications that you mentioned to me earlier? Yeah, um, target communication is really important in public health. Um, so, for example, in the United States and a lot of major cities, we have low vaccination rates, but there's really different populations that you see. You have usually a lot of times populations of undocumented immigrants who lack access to care. You have tightly knit immigrant or religious communities who have been targeted explicitly by vaccine resistors. And then you have rich white people who because they you know, have some belief that vaccines are bad, won't vaccinate their children. And so the message that pro-vaccine groups use to reach these groups are very different. Um, so you, know, uh, you really have to think about those targeted communities when you're in public health. And so for journalists, I want you to think about the fact that you know you have a target audience, that not everyone's reading your reporting, um, and think about the way that would be most efficient to reach them. Uh, and so you probably have already been doing that because 
you're journalists, you've been working in this business for a long time, but like at times a public health crisis becomes even more important because you're trying to overcome uh, so many existing prejudices, existing notions, existing ways of thought. And if that's happening in reporting that you might be doing about the stock market, that's one thing. But when it's reporting on something like COVID-19, when people's lives are at stake, that becomes another one. So thinking about that targeted and what is the demographic I'm appealing to and how can I best reach out to them? Um, how are they taking in information? So you actually saw really great um, action around Ebola of you know, radio stations being so important um, in uh, areas where Ebola was impacting people and really trying to get the message and communication out via uh, radio and especially through songs. So there's a lot of great Ebola related songs that come out about, you know, staying away from people who are sick and um, how to, uh, you know, properly contain yourself and uh, reporting in if you thought you had symptoms. So yeah, it was, uh, you know, working together between public health and media that was really successful. Yeah, um, so uh, I just don't want to correct that, like uh, um, confirm that the two newsletters you mentioned that are recommending people to subscribe, one is the Global Health Now uh, affiliated with uh, John Hopkins University, another is the CIDRAP um, affiliated with the University of Minnesota. Yeah, that's both of them. Yeah, sorry, SIDRAP, uh, hard to unpackage what that is, but yeah, that's what both of them are. And John, uh, Global Health Now is really more the journalism end, and SIDRAP is more the scientific end. That's awesome. So um, I'll just uh, um, turn to questions now because we have uh, only less than 10 minutes. Um, there are some, um, uh, one really asked a really interesting question of how the um, government action, uh, action after uh, they read your reporting from like maybe Jen and Claire can talk about it. Did, um, did you receive any backlash? Is there any online harassment? And how do you um, report while maintaining you know, um, your own safety as well as uh, your sources to safety? Um, Jen, do you want to start? Uh, sure, yeah, I think um, I personally, I haven't come across too much harassment, but I do. So very interestingly, I think on the government side, I didn't get any phone calls from you know the government, because um, but I think interestingly, I got some angry emails from both Chinese and American readers. So Chinese readers, they will be like, "Oh, you are a traitor to China. You are being so hostile towards your own country in your reporting." American readers will be like, "Oh, you are being so soft uh, in terms of criticizing China." So that is a very interesting phenomenon, I guess. Uh, most of China, uh, China folks' uh, correspondents, no matter which country they're from, this is a common problem we're facing. Like readers, they have different opinions, perspectives, which is fine. But um, so I think this, this is like some of the uh, from harassment I've come across. And some other times, um, so in terms of protecting myself and my sources, I think, uh, as I said before, I think the challenge is mostly to try how to communicate with my um, subjects, people I'm talking to in a very transparent way. So you have to let them know the possible um, risks they're taking for talking to you because you can't lie to them. And then, but also um, you wouldn't want to scare them too much. So they would just stop talking to you. So I think just, so for, my, for myself, I just try to always tell them which, of course, which media I work for and what the courts do and, um, um, how we're trying to report things objectively and I would tell the person um, uh, what kind of information I try to I, I want to get from him or her and just like I think just be uh, and be always responsive because people uh, I'm not quite sure about situation elsewhere but in China people would have lots of doubts about uh, talking to a to journalists no matter which media they work for so you have to be whenever they have any kind of questions, you always have to be very responsive, no matter it's like, if it's a very important source, I would always try to um, reply to their questions as soon as possible as I say them. So I think I just found some of the experiences I learned uh, during my reporting. 
Yeah, um, digital security is very important for LMF as well. Um, so we have, a, a, I would say the CPJ guide I recommended also mentioned a lot of content about digital security. So I recommend everyone to take a look when you communicate with your sources, what are the safest way to protect both you and your sources. Um, Claire, do you want to mention a little bit of, uh, did you receive any um, kind of uh, um, thread or in the field or like when you coming out reporting on those issues? Um, in West Africa? Um, sure. I mean, I think one thing that was a, a major issue at the beginning of the outbreak is you definitely didn't want to be, the, you definitely didn't want to be identified as a health worker or, you know, anyone who was sort of part of a burial team or whatever. So there was sort of, I guess, some, um, you know, well, not foreigners weren't really part of the burial teams, but there was sort of, I mean, you did feel like you didn't really want to be identified as a health worker back then. So that's sort of something you needed to be, um, sort of cautious about and I think sort of entering communities, um, you know, that are, are really sort of frightened. I think that was another thing that you had to be um, cautious about. I did on, on sort of one occasion, you know, I did have a couple of uh, phone calls from people in the government and one, um, you know, like I got called from the Ministry of Information at one point and obviously a very different sort of media climate to China. Um, but um, but I think that um, it was it was sort of like a relatively good um, or a relatively open discussion, um, you know, and I think that, um, you know, it, it, it was on some levels a little bit intimidating, but I think that, you know, it was good to be able to sort of have a discussion about, you know, um, the government's concerns about how they were being represented um, and to, to sort of, yeah, just chat about it as well. Yeah, there are some questions related to um, how to uh, prevent um, and set boundaries for freelancers. Um, for, for Kate, but before Kate answered that, I want to just mention that um, there are a lot of resources on Dart Center. Um, if you want to look it up uh, um, on trauma reporting as well as self care, um, definitely that's very useful. Uh, as well as uh, if you are a freelancer, you should look into um, ACOS Alliance, um, a, a culture of safety. Um, alliance. Um, that's uh, that's. They are also providing a lot of resources for journalists, including insurance, including um, uh, other resources uh, from the member uh, organizations like the Iron Lab. Kate, um, can you talk a little bit about the boundaries that uh, freelancers to set um, um, at this time? You know, it, it's such a big conversation. I don't want to pretend there's a simple answer when there's everything from, you know, needing to produce in order to make a living, um, you know, to um, just the reality of telling a story really well, right? Which is you guys are, you, you know, you're, you're um, high, high level journalists. You don't want to do half a job. I know that. But, but the idea of boundaries um, psychologically has to do with both the ways that we create scaffolding around ourselves. Um, and to, to create safety for ourselves, as well as rest for ourselves, and as well as a break. Um, but also how we tolerate the feeling of setting those boundaries. Because I think for a lot of us, we can sort of go, yeah, yeah, boundaries, I know, I know. You know, next, next project, I swear I'll get some boundaries. Um, and, and the idea is that it's not about um, just saying no to things. It's about, again, an intentional practice where you say, this is enough, this thing I'm about to do, you know, whatever I define it as this is enough for this, for this situation and for me. You know, I can write this piece, I can take these photographs, I can you know, reach out, and I have to be able to tolerate that even in an extraordinarily painful and you know, massively changing situation, um, that's the bit I can do and that that's okay. And so that's where it becomes like, if, again, if you think about biopsychosocial, the psychological part there, feelings and thoughts, is making a decision and then being able to tolerate the feelings that come with it. And again, I, I, I know that is, sounds kind of like, yeah, yeah, but it really is a, a key way to move towards a sense of well-being is to recognize that it's okay to have a boundary in which you stop and you say, I can't do any more, I can't save people in this way. And then, and then live with what I'm doing, meaning waking, what I'm doing is good enough and it's, it's part of the fight. So I'll, I'll end with that. Great, um, we are perfect on timing. Uh, just let everyone know that we have recorded um, this uh, webinar and we will be sharing the link um, later on the IMF's social media platform soon. 
Uh, we're also sending our newsletter today and it will include this link as well. Um, please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram if you haven't yet. Um, if you would like to um, share this webinar with your friends and colleagues, please feel free to do so later. And if you have any questions for our panelists, feel free to reach out to them individually. Uh, you can find them on social media for the journalists and uh, um, for Rebecca and uh, Kate, um, their um, email are all on their um, website as well. Um, so thank you again for joining us and uh, wish everyone be well and safe. And we'll see you at our next webinar. Bye.